Welcome to our platform series with Andre and Julian. In our last video, we talked about three methods of how you can move from a product to a platform business. In this video, we will be talking about one of the most hype and confused topic, network effects. Not all network effects are created equal. With all the hype and claims from startup to investors about their network effects, we will explore the seven questions that you can ask to evaluate how defensible or strong are these network effects. Let's set the context with the first question. What are network effects and why is it so desirable? So network effects arise for products or services where the value for an individual user or customer increases where, as more customers use the same product. So think social networks like Facebook, you know, the value to an individual user is increasing in the number of users. Or think, think of any marketplace. So you have buyers and sellers. The more buyers participate on the marketplace, the more valuable it is to sellers and vice versa. Why is this so desirable? So as I think we, we had talked about in the last video, the, the reason like every investor and every uh, entrepreneur wants to build or to invest in the next big network effect business is because so number one, network effects create huge, uh, like potentially like huge scalability. So business can grow very fast at very low cost so and and they can they can be very defensive so the more the more people or the more users join a particular network or a particular platform the more valuable it becomes obviously it's harder for them to switch to a new entrant or to a new competitor and at the same time they do this at a very low cost in the sense typically when you have platforms with network effects the platform doesn't really have to control or do everything basically the value is created by the participation of the users so if all goes well you can achieve a lot of value at very low cost and grow very very fast what is the first question they can ask first and most primary question would be just to ask like to what extent the users really care about how many other users are buying the same product or service, right? Um, if they obviously they don't care very much, there's really not much of a network effect in the first place. So often these network effects are you know, not actually that material. And we want to sort of look at like how important really are they? So, you know, just to give you an example, I mean, obviously this, you know, Andre mentioned Facebook and um, businesses like that, which have very strong network effects, right? And very important for their business. But there are other businesses which you know people talk about as you know these are there's network effects and this uh platform businesses and so on for instance p2p lending platforms right p2p lending platforms are where you know uh, investors invest in loans that are directly with businesses that are taking out loans and these were you know the, the examples where um it would be like lending club Right. So Lending Club was one of the first in the US that did this. Uh, individual investors put in money and they were lending out to individual businesses. It could be also other individuals. Um, you know, what are the network effects in this kind of business? Right. Um, from the investor's point of view, well, they want to have a you know multiple different businesses they can lend to. So obviously they care like there are more, there's more than one business they're lending to. But they don't need like thousands and thousands. They just need enough to diversify their portfolio a little bit. Uh, on the borrower's side, the company side, they don't actually need, they don't really care how many investors are putting in money. In. They just need to access money. They just want to borrow money. They don't care where it comes from. So uh, the network effects here are actually not very strong, right? And interestingly, if you look at these P2P lending platforms over time, they moved away from having individual investors towards institutional investors. So now most of the money is coming from a few large institutional investors. If you look at Lending Club, which is one of the biggest in the US, about 95% of their money is coming from institutional investors. Uh, so the idea of like having lots of individual investors lending to lots of individual borrowers has actually not really worked out that well okay. right so I, I just want to emphasize here so this is a very in some sense it's almost like it, it may sound like a silly question but it's actually just making sure it's very important to ask it's a very basic question and it's very important to be to have very high standards right so like okay yes by definition network effects involve users caring about the presence of other users but you really have to dig a little bit and say like do they really really care about other users on the same side or on the other side so i mean we see this or julian and i see this all the time where like if you look hard enough you can start basically seeing network effects everywhere but the point is like in some cases they're just like not very strong they're not very important like lending club is a good example 
And another, actually another common confusion that people make here, which we see all the time with startups, is they tend to confuse network effects with virality. Uh, so they would basically say, oh, you know, this product has network effects because people will tell their friends and they would adopt the same product. No, that is virality. That just means that that, that would be true for any product. You can put up a shoe or, to, or a brand of toothpaste. And if people, if you, if you do a somewhat clever marketing campaign, people will tell their friends. That's not a network effect. That's just basically people becoming aware of the product. I think it's very important to separate the two. And again, come back to the question, do people really care when they're buying the product about the number of other people or other users that use the same product or platform? Maybe the WeWork example also would be a good one to clarify because obviously, you know, there are some discussion that WeWork has, you know, network effects. And there is an article that you have linked here, you know, um, about, you know, whether they really have network effects or not. Sure. I mean, that's that's a good example of like overclaiming network effects. So, I mean, I, I think the the, found, the legendary founder of, uh, of WeWork at some point was claiming to everyone who would listen that his business is not just, you know, it's basically not just like renting retail or real estate space. It's an operating system for for life. And therefore, it has network effects because he would pro- there's like lots of other services that businesses, local businesses would provide to the companies that rent space in WeWork. So, I mean, to some degree, it's like, sure, Sure. Like the fact that WeWork has lots of tenants attracts some local businesses to offer, you know, to offer their service. We have again come back to the question: Do business when businesses decide whether or not to rent space in WeWork, do they think about well, how many other businesses are providing services like whatever local local stuff at WeWork? And no one really cares. I mean, they're thinking, what's the price? What's the space? And and so on. So it's just not very important. Let's talk about the second question then. Yeah. So the second question. Uh, that we like to ask is to think about how quickly does this extra value you get as you add additional users diminish, right? So you might have a situation where there's a lot of value added as you add more users, right, to each individual user, but that only lasts for some time and then it, it peters out. And of course, you know, most network effects will eventually diminish, right? As you add the, th- the thousandth Facebook user, you're adding quite a lot of value as you add the million, you're probably still adding quite a lot of value, but as you add the billion Facebook user, like how much value does that user add to everyone else? You know, it, at some point it must diminish, at least when you run out of the population on earth. So, um, you know, we're, we're trying to understand like, what does that curve look like as you think about adding more and more users and thinking about the marginal network effect that's generated um, and seeing how much that diminishes. So, you know, one example where, I like to think about um, where this you can sort of concretely think about diminishing would be something like Uber, right, with ride hailing. So, you know, you ask how many drivers do you need in a city to get to the point where customers are pretty happy, they can get the the core Uber and it comes within a few minutes, right? At that point, as you add more and more drivers, the additional benefit in terms of this network effect is really diminishing, right? I mean, once you get down to a few minutes, you add you double the number of drivers, it's not going to add that much more value. So that sort of concretely illustrates this idea, even though, you know, Uber does have quite long lasting network effects, because you need to get to that point where you get it down to rides within a few minutes, but it, you can see it diminishing at that point. Just to, 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 to sum it up and to compare with the first question, the first question was about the total level, the total value add of network effect. The second question is more about like, how quickly do you get to this total level? So in some cases, the value of the network effect flattens out very quickly. So, you know, after you get a few users, basically you get all the value of network effects. That was Julian's Uber example. In some other cases, you actually need a lot of users to generate the total value. So the network effects keep increasing for longer. So yes, obviously, if we have a choice, we prefer to invest or, you know, to look at uh, network effects that, you know, remain, that keep growing for much longer. But at some level, it is also a static thing, right? Because as you know, product features and functionalities as they grow, um, I mean, you can't really fully predict in the beginning as well, because the startup obviously will add product functionality features that could increase value and increase the connection between the user that will add value to the, and, and that will add value and also increase um, additional network effects. Wouldn't that be? I think that's a very good point, Josephine. So I think that's so it, it is just, as we go through these questions, I think it's important to keep in mind. So we always want to have this. So we always have in mind, okay, there's a part of it which is kind of exogenously given by the nature of the market, by the nature of the product. But certainly in a lot of cases, the company, the startup can do something about it, right? I mean, you can sort of do something with product design or adding new features in order to kind of push the envelope. Now, 
I think there are limits. So again, there's exogenously given limits and we try to get at those. So, I mean, with our questions, we try to get at the exogenous limits, but obviously this should also suggest to the startups, well, maybe there are ways in which we can uh, we can enhance the value of our network. Yeah, I would like to flip it to see how we can add value and, you know, make that happen instead. I mean, if you think about social network, um, and we talked about Facebook, right? It has a pretty strong network effect that's long lasting. I guess maybe it's helpful to think about when that might, not be the case right and that might not be the case if you have a social network where you don't actually want too many people right it's, it's somewhat exclusive so if you think about a club like a country club or that kind of social network well actually you know as you add too many people the value becomes less and less not only diminishes it may even become sort of the marginal value becomes negative so you know you can see in those types of social networks there's a very clear diminishing uh network effect it's very important so i think it's very important to be clear here this is not about so when we say the graph like how quickly or how slowly the network effects are increasing this is not versus time this is as a function of number of users it doesn't matter if it's today it's in the future it's like total like we're looking at the potential like we're looking okay suppose like everything goes well like i don't care about over what time it's like how much do people care so back to the first question how much do people care over other users. This is not over time. So it's like in, in general, how much do they care about other users? The second question is, as a function of other users, how like how much does the uh, the value to an individual user increase? Um, so, I understand uh, that. I think the key thing was really, obviously you take time to accumulate the users because I'm saying time, but obviously it's for number of users. But the thing is as an investment, you're, in, you're investing in the potent, future potential of the startup, right? From the perspective. Yes. We are investing yeah, you're so investing in the potential, but you know, you're really thinking about market size, right? And what is the potential of this? And ideally we're investing in a business that has a very large market size where that size is realized through the network effect, right? Like as it becomes more and more valuable, more and more people join, and we want that process to go on for a long time uh, and reach a large scale. So the business becomes very large through the network effect. So question three is asking for marketplaces in particular, do buyers view the suppliers as differentiated or distinct, right? Or do they view them as interchangeable, homogeneous providers of the same product or service? Um, so here we, you know, we, we like to contrast marketplaces where really what matters is having a, a wide range of suppliers, even sometimes what we call a long tail of suppliers that are going to appeal to different types of consumers, like you know your airbnb your ebay right which have thousands and <clears throat> thousands and thousands of suppliers and you know they all have they're all distinct and they will provide different value to different types of consumers uh, as opposed to marketplaces where the supply side is very homogeneous um, and so this might be the case of something like fiverr or upwork or uber where um, you know at least in fiverr and upwork for certain basic services and uber obviously ride hailing uh, it's a fairly homogeneous service. The suppliers, uh, you know, the, the, the consumers don't care that much about the particular supplier. As long as they provide the basic service at a reasonable price, that's all they care about. Uh, and so this distinction is important because if you have a, you know, a lot of differentiation on the supply side, then the uh, sort of the network effect is, is going to be much stronger, much more value can be created by adding more and more suppliers because you get that heterogeneity, which is what the consumers are looking for, right? They can find their perfect match. Yeah, and I would add this also ties into, so it's the strength of the network effects, but obviously it also ties into the into defensibility as well. If the supply side is differentiated, well, you actually need this base of differentiated suppliers. But if, if say it's a commodity, it basically everyone draws from the same pool of undifferentiated suppliers, well, it's much easier for someone to come along later and imitate what you're doing and drawing from the same pool of supply. So it's it's less defensive. Would you talk more about the one that has a, the, the distinctive, you know, supplier like um, Airbnb and Cameo? Thanks for letting me discover Cameo because I had so much fun with it. You know, having Brian Cox from Succession say, oh, you know, that well, was a really good cool. one. You should tell us, you should tell yeah, us. You could favorite. describe Cameo for, so people know and then we can tell you why yeah you should uh, josephine you should you should um you should let us know your favorite actors and we'll offer you whatever like a personalized message from your favorite actor from coming <laughs> for your birthday i was surprised to find i'll just say i'm surprised to find sarah palin there i'm surprised of to find, i'm surprised to find kenny g there because i'm like is he still alive <laughs> because I'm like, i knew he was still 
was so young. I'm like, my God, this man did not age at all, you know, from the perspective. And then obviously, everybody's watching Succession. So. Hi, I'm Brian Cox. I play Logan Roy. And if you want me, I will tell you to fuck off in a very uncertain manner, okay? In Australia, might be very popular. Well, yeah, so, doing really well. Yeah, Cameo is a great example of this because you know they they just have such a wide range of uh, you know different celebrities. Actually, not just you know from movies or music, right? Like you, you get some pretty um, unusual characters on there. From ex politicians, yeah. um, like Rudy Rudy Giuliani is is there yeah. now. Like anyone really? that would make fun of Rudy Giuliani, you can get him. Yeah, <laughs> and you have comedians, yeah. you have the reality TV stars. Yeah. You have yeah. composer like David Foster, is it? Or oh, Catherine Murphy, you know, kind of thing. And it's such a, I, I wonder, and I will ask you a question in terms of defensibility. Is it a lockdown thing also that is exaggerated the demand for it? Do you feel that like, after lockdown might not, the hype sort of like the novelty of it might wear off, you know, from that perspective? Because it's like, why do they do it? Like every, if I record this for three minutes, I make 300 bucks, you know, as an actress. Like what, what's the, what's, what, why? Well, I mean, there's, there's many use cases right like i mean definitely lockdown help because people are bored at home and looking for something novel to do but i mean you can think about many different use cases i would just like to get so for me i would get like some basketball player because andre is a big basketball fan and you know like surprise andre on his on his birthday or something and get this guy to talk to him um you know like people do it as a lot of them are gifting i think you know but other people yeah yeah i think a lot of the use cases a lot of the use cases don't necessarily depend on the lockdown i think it was it was already doing very well before that before um, before the lockdown yeah but it's a phenomenal way for a lot of these comedians and artists to find work with their time as well given the yeah. fact that they can't perform so that's like a really interesting one so thanks by the way just to just to make it clear to your audience so this is basically what they offer is access to c-list celebrities and below you're not going to find brad pitt or anyone that actually <laughs> like, anyone that that's really famous just to be clear like my favorite basketball players are not going to be there <laughs> uh if, if they're still if they're still serious like you have to go it look pretty like you have to look pretty carefully so but but yes it's true like these are people who probably again i don't know they probably don't have a lot of work and this is a very easy way for them to make money it's super easy it's super simple and, and the fact that they're c-list right that just sort of illustrates this idea like this long tail of suppliers mm. right like yeah. these are not the most popular suppliers that or content creators that everyone wants but still there is some demand for them from some people but that's the distinctiveness actually add on to the variety which is what you're saying which is like airbnb any additional you know artists you know whatever add to the flavor of the marketplace itself i mean when i use airbnb i'm looking for very specific things, right? Which, you know, not everyone else is looking for. And so having that richness in supply really helped in finding the right matches. And that becomes very defensible, right? I'm always gonna search on Airbnb first because I'm more like to find that particular place that I'm looking for. So what would be the fourth question? So the fourth question, we can make this short and sweet, and I think it's pretty obvious, is the network effect global or local? And, you know, you can ask the question, well, which one's better? It should be obvious that it's better, like all other things equal. We want to invest or we want to see global network effect. So a good example, a good contrast would be, say, compare Uber to Airbnb. In case of Uber, the network effects are very local in the sense that I'm in Boston, I care. So I'm if I open my Uber app, I care about my wait time. So therefore, the number of drivers there in Boston. I couldn't care less about how Uber, how many drivers they have in San Francisco or in Singapore or anywhere else for that matter. And vice versa, the drivers only care about the number of users in their area or in their city, not somewhere else. Now contrast this with something like Airbnb, which is fundamentally like a global business, like the network effects are global. Again, I'm in Boston, but I want to travel to Singapore or to Australia. So obviously it matters to me that Airbnb can offer uh, houses or places to stay all around the world. And the same thing for the same thing for the hosts, right? They can get people from all around the world. So all other things equal, I'd much, I'd much rather have Airbnb because, you know, the, net, the network effects span the globe as opposed to being completely low. And same as we talked about before, it also makes them more defensible. In the case of Uber, they basically have to fight city by city. So, you know, they get Boston and they have to go to San Francisco and start from zero. Airbnb, once they had a bunch of cities, now it's very easy for them to move into a new country, for example, because they already have lots of other countries, lots of other users. So that gives them a huge advantage. I would just add on that while we would much rather invest in you know airbnb than uber 
Um, of course, it's also much harder for Airbnb to get off the ground, right? Like building a business which has global network effect really relies on adoption across a wide range of places. You know, they might start somewhere, but the ability to grow that and get to that outcome is much harder. So, um, you know, we also look at obviously whether the likelihood that's actually going to get off the ground. Um, and that just illustrates how much more defensible it is, right? Once you've built one of these global, you know, a business with global network effects, it's very hard for anyone else to come in. They have to somehow enter in multiple markets at the same time and grow the grow the business to compete. I guess you're assuming that uh, these are what I call a uh, uh, network effects or marketplace that need a physical delivery or physical kind of a goods or whatever, right? I mean, like Airbnb, you obviously need to fly. You know, Uber is location specific. Uh, if it's a digital delivery type of a marketplace, it's immediately always global, right? It's like even like your uh, wouldn't that be location doesn't that's matter. Good point. Yeah, that's a good point. I think in general that's true. I'm trying to think. I mean, there are language Airbnb. there are language differences. Yeah, so right there. Yeah. I think in general it's true exactly, but there might be for actually, for example, we're, we were just discussing recently a, um, a marketplace for tutors for languages, right? So it is by definition global, but it's not as global as Airbnb because basically you need the language speakers from like very specific countries, for example, if it's English. So I guess like you can find like there are people that want to learn English in many countries in the world and you can find many native English speakers well in English countries but and yeah so it is global but I guess it's not as global as Airbnb I think by and large just again I think you're right so with digital products and I mean the other part is like you're right so I think it's as long as there's a physical component then there, there may be some fr like international travel or like uh, or shipping friction but with digital things in principle there should be like yeah the, like the, the geographic barriers vanish much more. yeah that's why I think because yeah. then there's no local or global definition in, in any digital delivery whatever buy sell connection and whatever exchange that it is if it's a digital delivery it's regardless just like your NFT marketplace it doesn't really matter that's right yeah I think the future will be that it, there will be more of these like global ones but again I think it's very important to realize what Julian pointed out. I mean, there's lots of reasons. I mean, there's different countries have different regulations, different policies. So geographic barriers still matter to a certain extent for um, even for the most digital of marketplaces. I mean, you'd be surprised that something like Cameo, which is clearly international, there are a bunch of competitors in other countries, right? Like if I'm going to do the K-pop market or the, you know, um, a particular Bollywood. country's <laughs> Bollywood, yeah. I mean, I need to, first of all, I need to have, I need to get those people on there, right? And I, if I don't have the connections, even though I, you know, have a lot of people in the US and Australia and UK coming to my site, it may not help that much, right? And so yeah. you could get a local player who has those connections, build up a cameo competitor in their local market because they have, you know, the right they can get the right c-list celebrities on there from their local market right okay so i guess and of course, you know that's in their own language right like their own language which cameo is is i don't i don't think it covers all languages yeah okay so i think your global local like physical distance culture barrier or whatever anything that's specific to the the delivery and the connection because even like your example with swimply right i mean like it, it, that your favorite swimply it's like the connection is has to be local because Obviously, I gotta go to the swimming pool around me. So it's like the connection just has to be within the cluster of the local. Swimply, Swimply would be just like Uber, right? They have to go market yes. by market and build up. You know, they have local network effects. They have to go to each new market. But the one thing that helps them, which is more about virality, is you know they get word of mouth uh, through press because it's an interesting business, right? And so that helps spread the word across different locations. I would add one thing to Swimply though. I think it's an interesting example. I would put it somewhere in between Uber and Airbnb. Certainly maybe closer to Uber. What you say was that because Swimply is, you say is like in between like uh, Uber uh, Uber and uh, Airbnb. And I would just want to ex explain that is because like Swimply in some ways is because it has a distinctiveness of the different pools I get to see, which is like, I feel like Airbnb, right? Uh, but it's different, it's better than Uber is because, uh, 
it's similar to Uber because of the locationality kind of thing that is required. Uh, so it I guess it, whether it's low, whether, ne whether the network effects are local or global depends on how people are using it. If it's mostly, let's say, families that want to go in their own neighborhoods, that's fine. Then it's like Uber. But if it's people that travel internationally and, you know, let's say I want to go to Australia and, you know, when I'm there, I just want to go to someone's house and like, like swim, like find a swimming pool. That makes it a little bit like there's an element of global, I guess. Right. But I think Andre is also saying like Airbnb, you might plan your trip, right? And as part of planning your trip, you might want to have uh, some time swimming when you come to Australia <laughs> in the nice weather, right? <laughs> so you so might well also, you so might also book some swimply locations. <laughs> I mean, you could say the same thing for Uber, right? You could, there are people who travel who want to have open their Uber app That's and fair. be able to use it everywhere. Yes. I guess uh, the question is, do you make the decision? So all, to it, it comes back to our first point, like how strong is that effect? Yeah, so I, I think that there's an interesting point here. So maybe it comes down to what I would say is like, yeah, because you can, so in principle, yes, you care, but I think it's when do you make the decision? It's like, if you make, if I have to, so in the case of Uber, is, is, there's no question. I don't make, like, I'm not going to plan my Uber before I leave my house in, I'm not going to book my Uber in Singapore before I leave from Boston. In the case of Swimply, I don't know, but I guess you're right. Like it's more likely that I get to my destination and then I start looking for, for this kind of stuff. For Airbnb, obviously you do this, like once you're at, when you're at home, you book the thing. But, but you so, might, um, if you're in Singapore, like I am, uh, you might download Uber on your phone because when you travel, you're going to have that option. In fact, I true. do that. So I have Uber on my phone. Uber is not in Singapore. I can't use it in Singapore, but I still have Uber on my phone. I have the, I have my, you know, account there so that when I travel, I can use it. So there's, there is a little bit of an international global network effect, but it's, it's, it's the point is it's minor. If there's some better service that when I travel, I can use. It turns out like, uh, you know, using a, an, another provider is better than I'll just switch, right? But by the way, so I think there's two separate points in there. And that's a nice transition, by the way, to question five. So what you just mentioned with Uber, I would say it's an issue of like switching costs or like familiarity. What I mentioned, I think there's it's a separate thing. It's like, do I make the decision to jo like to basically like to transact with someone on this marketplace? Do I make it before traveling or do I make it like once I'm in once I'm in a specific spot? I think both matter. Um, but this this last one that you mentioned obviously provides very good segue okay. into question number five. Um, well, that's, before we go to the fifth question, right? Because you have a key distinction that you say that the last four questions that we have talked about, it's really about the strength of the network effects. And the next three that we're going to talk about are really about defensibility. Can you just quickly talk about like what what, what is the difference? I, I, I'm thinking that if it's strong network effect, it just means it's you know good defensibility. So like what what is the subtle difference between the two? Yeah, the the defensibility we already mentioned several times. You can see there's a pretty blurry line between these two. But I mean, broadly, the idea was in those first questions, we're in some sense we're talking about what is the potential, right? What is the potential you can reach? Uh, and we're trying to understand that. You may be able to reach very high potential in terms of growing business through network effect. Like Zoom, you know, Zoom has massive network effects and it's grown very big. But then the question is, is that defensible? Uh, and Uber is another example, right? Uber has strong network effects because you want to join where there are more drivers and drivers want to join where there are more uh you know, people looking for rides. So strong network effects, but how defensible is it? And so that that's where the next questions come in. We're sort of asking, okay, even though there may be very strong network effects, it doesn't necessarily mean it's very defensible business. I agree. I would add, so the one thing, the one thing I would, so I think the right sort of, uh, I've done this with students over the past few days and it just occurred to me, like a good metaphor to, to have in mind is the following. So when we are, so, of course, they're related. There's no question that if the network effect is stronger, maybe defensibility is higher, but they're certainly not equivalent. I mean, I think that was Julian's point and it's very important. It's very possible that you have extremely valuable, extremely strong network effects. But let's say, what if it's very easy, like there's no switching costs, like everyone can multi-home on multiple platforms at no cost whatsoever. Well, there's not a lot of defensibility. So it's possible to have very strong network effects, but not very different. So the way I think about defensibility is like, you know, I show students like, um, British. Oh, I showed them a castle on top of a of a mountain, and it's basically defensibility. Obviously, comes from like the metaphor comes from war. So it's this idea that it's not about like how good my features are relative to my whatever my opponents, but it's basically what you're looking for in defensibility is like is there some inherent something inherent in the position that I'm occupying that makes it harder for the second mover to come beat me. 
So obviously, if I put my army on top of a hill, I don't have to be better than my opponent. Just by virtue of being on top of a hill, I just have an advantage relative to the whatever the, the next next army along. Okay, so maybe another way to say, in my, if, if I understand this correctly, is that if it has strong network effects, the potentiality that this business will be a good and strong market, as you say, potential of the market itself, is a good uh, potential market and business that will occupy a valuable and, you know, big enough market, uh, a, a business in a big and a valuable market itself, right? And But it, if, if it is not highly defensible in terms of its network effect, is that probably it will become a duopoly, or it will become a multiple, you know, players that's in a, in this valuable market, right? Because for example, Airbnb, highly defensible and strong, but possibly highly defensible. And that's the reason why you don't have a, another similar player around, you know, for that matter. But Uber, highly variable and highly strong, you know, uh, network effects. Therefore, it's a good company, good valuable market, high growth. But then you have a, diff, a lot of different players, you know, that are in the same market because it's highly not defensible. The defensibility is not as strong. Is that how? I, I think that's, that's a really good way of thinking about it. Like the market, the network effects of the market may be very strong, mm. but it doesn't mean an individual player can therefore Dominate. monopolize it, right? right? It, it's not necessarily going to tip to one player if it's not a very defensible kind of network effect, right? Mm. And, you know, you see Clubhouse would be another example where, yeah. you know, it looks like there's pretty good network effects, there's discoverability and so on, but it's, it's actually not very defensible because it's easy to copy. Okay. Uh, so the fifth question is about multi-homing. So how difficult is it for buyers, suppliers, or users to multi-home? And uh, let me define multi-homing first. So multi-homing is just the idea that the users are going to join multiple competing platforms right, in order to interact with users on the other side. So developers may develop for iOS and Android because they want to reach all the iOS and Android users, right? Uh, merchants may accept MasterCard and Visa because they want to reach all the consumers who have those different, who are using those different cards. Um, and there's lots and lots of examples like that. So people are joining multiple platforms. We say they're multi-homing, right? They're adopting competing platforms. Um, and the question here is how difficult is it for users to do that? So if you're thinking about, you know, users multi-homing on Android and iOS from the consumer side, that's kind of difficult. You're going to have to go and purchase both an Android phone and an iOS phone, right? Um, but maybe for MasterCard and Visa, that's easy, right? As a consumer, it's easy for me to get both types of cards, right, and use them. So multi-homing can vary. Um, and our point here is if multi-homing is very easy, intrinsically quite easy, there's no barriers to it, then you're going to have less defensibility because it becomes much easier for a new platform to come in. And the ex existing users of the incumbent platform don't have to give up that platform in order to use your service. They can multi-home. They can use both at the same time. And that makes it much easier for platforms to enter. Um, so if you look at um, those platforms where you see a lot of multi-homing, like payments, MasterCard, Visa, American Express, and so on, you see you don't see tipping, right? You see competing platforms. Uber and Lyft, right? Same thing, multi-homing is easy on both sides. Lots of people drive for both Uber and Lyft. Lots of people use both Uber and Lyft on the consumer side. Food delivery, another example. Booking platforms like Booking Expedia. All these examples, you don't see tipping, unlike Airbnb, you don't see tipping to one player because multi-homing is quite prevalent. What, what would be some examples of um, that would stop somebody to multi-home or create it, make it more difficult for them to multi-home? So this is where, I mean, uh, not to beat up on Uber, but I think the comparison between Uber and Airbnb is pretty, uh, it, it remains interesting here too, right? So as Julian mentioned, I think multi-home is very easy on Uber, both for the drivers and the riders. Now think about Airbnb, contrast this with Airbnb. I would say, so in the case of an Airbnb, they do have competitors, but they're very small. So the competitors would be like VRBO and Home and Away. From the perspective of users, I think multi-homing is relatively easy. I mean, it's pretty easy to have accounts on both. And you can, I guess you can search for homes on both. The interesting part is if to think about it from the perspective of host. So yeah, it is easy to create accounts on both, but it's actually pretty difficult, like because you only have say one house, it's hard to manage the calendar, like or the, the scheduling for one house on two different platforms. Like you probably don't want to do that because it can lead to obviously to conflict. So in that, I mean, that's one factor that can make, you know, scheduling is a big deal. Like if it's, you know, physical property and it's limited capacity, 
obviously that makes multi-homing harder. And of course, by the way, you can think about it. So you can always take the perspective of the company and think about, well, if multi-homing costs are low, what can I do to make multi-homing harder? And therefore, I guess, force users, if you believe that users will choose you, you want to force them to choose and stick with you and not your competitor. You know, so there are things you can do to make, um, I guess, to make them make some investments in using you that basically makes them less likely to use other platforms. I think that was a good, good one, the calendaring, because I didn't th- think about that. The reputation and ratings, uh, people are selling something that you are, you know, on on Amazon and eBay, you know, that you already built up, you know, your credentials. Monetary or non-monetary cost of joining is one. So my other question is, what about utility itself of the platform of usage of putting a product onto it, or which actually then create data stickiness onto the onto the platform? Because if you have more data already on one platform that you're invested in it, you would not shift it. You know, for one example I'm having in mind is obviously a client I have is that um, it, it, it has a deli- it's like a delivery for a certain product, um, but it, it could be used for the SME or the small players itself to actually invoice their client or to create their client, uh, c- collect the client data at the same time. So there's a utility on the platform that they provide as usage. And as is more invoice and customer queries or quotation or requirements come to the platform, they are actually creating and owning, holding those customer data on that platform. So that it's more difficult for this person to want to switch to another platform. Yes, to get yeah, that no, that's, that's actually a very important one, especially when we look at B2B um, businesses, right? We often trying to look for those that are building up something like a system of record for their clients, right? And that that actually uh, tends to not just lock in the clients in terms of switching costs, but it means multi-homing is is probably not going to work, right? Because they won't have all their data in one place. Um, so so I mean, yeah, yeah, I think that one that one's actually very important. Okay. Um, another another point um, we we mentioned briefly, which is you know the platforms can do things to enhance uh, the stickiness and reduce multi-homing. So it may be useful to think through like Uber's case, right? Because you know Uber has some very obvious options it could use to reduce multi-homing. Um, the most obvious is to say to the drivers, you have to be exclusively on Uber and you cannot drive for a rival. If you want to drive on Uber, you can only be on Uber. Now, this is this kind of exclusive dealing is something they actually did in Singapore. Um, and they put in those contracts that actually Grab had that uh, when it came in as well. Um, but the issue with that is it's usually found to be anti-competitive by competition authorities. So Uber and Lyft will not do that in the US because it would be anti-competitive, uh, would be found to be anti-competitive. Um, so they can't. But that would be an obvious way to create you know, a cost to well, make it almost impossible to be on both platforms, right? That you're going to be kicked off if you get caught multi-homing. Uh, so another thing they could do is they could try and you know put give drivers incentives to do all their driving on one platform, right? So they have, they design a reward system, a loyalty system where if they do more than 40 hours a week driving for for Uber, then they get like additional incentives and rewards in terms of the the payments. So this is sort of thing they do, uh, which is kind of like an exclusive contract, but it's done in an indirect way to try and avoid the the competition concerns. Um, Another thing they might do is just say, okay, we're going to employ you as a worker, right? As a full-time Uber employee, you know, then they have to give them all the benefits associated with employees. So they don't want to do that. Um, but, you know, these are all the kinds of issues that they can think about on the driver side. Similarly, on the rider side, they can try and reduce multi-homing by creating a membership plan. So when you pay a certain amount per month, then you get, you know, rides on Uber up to that point. And that you know, tends to reduce multi-homing um, once someone is in one of those membership plans. That's good. Okay, let's go to the sixth question. Right. So the, the sixth question asks, how easy is it for users to coordinate their adoption decisions? So this requires a bit of explanation. I think it's important to understand that with network effects, a fundamental reason that network effects lead to defensibility is the fact that it's very difficult once users, say, have coordinated on one platform, it's very difficult for them to coordinate on a new platform. So let's say, uh, you know, there's a coordinator on a platform that everyone likes, and there's a new platform that's better that comes along. Well, 
even if it's better, if the users can't talk to one another, let's say they can't have a WhatsApp group and then say, hey, we should all jump on the new platform, it's better, then the coordination is going to prevent the new better platform from, uh, from emerging. So in most cases, that's going to be true. So think about, for example, our, the, the Julian and I always give the example of Craigslist. So Craigslist is like online classifieds. It's been around since like 1996. And it's a really crappy experience. I mean, it's literally the experience of that they had in 1996 with very, very few improvements. Now, again, the reason they can get away with that is because a lot of buyers and a lot of sellers users and buyers and sellers cannot coordinate to say, like, what the hell are we doing here? We should just go on, on somewhere else. There's lots of other better options. So in that regard, because you know, buyers and sellers want to discover one another, there's just like there's no way for them to coordinate. Right. I mean, this is true in most markets, but there are examples. So this is why it's important to realize there are some cases um in which actually it's a lot it's a lot easier for users to coordinate on new platforms so take at the other extreme something like uh, you know vi uh, video conversation video uh, video chat or video conversation apps like zoom for instance well on zoom you typically don't want to talk to strangers it's basically you talk to people that you already know so when when we use zoom well typically someone sends a calendar invitation to everyone else by email well, they could just as easily send a calendar invitation for Google Meet or Microsoft Teams or something like that. So coordination here is actually very easy. So if Zoom was really that much worse than Google Meet or Microsoft Teams, it would be very easy for people who's like, I have no reason to use Zoom. I can for the next call, we can just jump on, on one of the other ones. Now, of course, there are other things like that we talked about. I mean, it's basically like you already learned how to use Zoom. There's some switching costs. But from a coordination standpoint, there's absolutely like it's very, very easy for people to coordinate on different platforms. So just focusing on that aspect, that actually is a concern of defense uh, for defensibility in the case because there's always like if someone comes comes up with like truly a much better platform, like most people can actually choose to use that. And let's give the example that Zoom decides to charge a dollar for every time you use Zoom for every user, right? Or, or even 10 cent, right? What would we do? We would all, when we want to communicate, we'd say, we'd send an email to each other or WhatsApp. We'd say, let's not use Zoom anymore because you know we don't want to pay. Let's all use Microsoft Teams. So that's the coordination, coordination of all of us to switch over and use a different platform whenever we want to communicate. Now that coordination happens amongst the people initiating the call, right? Like if I want to have a Zoom tomorrow with a with a group, I'm going to send, instead of sending a Zoom, uh, an email to say, let's meet on Zoom, I'll say, let's meet on Microsoft Teams because we save that 10 cents or a dollar each, you know. So it, the point is, even if they start to charge a small price, um, you know, a lot of people would switch. A lot of like, you know, consumers would switch. Of course, they still can charge for business users, um, which is a different market, but their regular sort of just household users of Zoom would just switch to another another platform. And they can do that because they can coordinate. OK, so in some ways is to coordinate in some way to go with, go to another platform or to transact in another platform kind of thing is to orchestrate that. Is that what you yeah, say? I mean, imagine trying to do that with um, we want to switch away from using eBay or Craigslist or Amazon, right? With, all the sellers and all the buyers want to switch away. We have no way of communicating amongst ourselves that we should do that and transact on a different platform, right? Because oh, yeah. it's just the nature of that. Those marketplaces is they're offering discoverability. So we don't actually know each other before we transact. And therefore, there's no way for us to communicate that, oh, we should actually go on this other marketplace because it's actually better, right? There are, if you think about Craigslist, there's other alternatives that are much better in the US, uh, you know, have are much easier to use, can take a photo and upload it of the product. And, uh, you know, it's just a much better user experience, like offer up. Um, but still, Craigslist persists for a long time just because it's hard to get all the buyers and all the sellers who don't know each other to coordinate and move over to that old, better alternative. Like from this regard, that's any time there's discoverability that you don't know. So the way to think about this, there's there's a certain this is not broadly. It's not like there are not that many marketplaces where this like co coordination is is easy. In most marketplaces that will come to your mind, we would probably coordination is very hard. But there are. I think it's very again. It's very important to realize that there are many in which actually coordination is quite easy. Like video chat apps, like it's very easy. Like we want to use House Party, you want to use WhatsApp. We can just say, okay, we'll use whichever we prefer for whatever reason. That yeah. actually makes it less defensible. Precisely because I know everyone I want to talk to, and I can we can easily communicate with one another and say we'll just use a different platform. The way we like to think about it is I want to come back to Julian's point is discoverability. 
there are other types of marketplaces where if you're only going there to transact with whatever people that you already know, coordination on a different marketplace could be easy. The moment you actually go there to discover new transaction partners, there's a coordination problem and therefore it's defensible. So an example um, of what Andre's just saying would be something like fitness instructors, right? So a marketplace for fitness, you could maybe online fitness, right? So if you have instructors that already have a large client base, right? And they want to switch to a different platform, they can just switch and then they can inform all their clients that I'm now on this other platform and all the clients come across. So it's not difficult in that case to, for suppliers to, and, and the users to switch to a different marketplace if it's much better or cheaper. Mm -hmm. um, because we're assuming that the main purpose of that platform is not discoverability. But the moment that you know, that platform is primarily the one that you go to to discover a new fitness instructor, then it becomes much harder because you know, they're going to attract uh, users coming in there who are just looking for new instructors and instructors want to be on there because they want to get new users. Yeah, I was just going to add, to, just to make it clear, the example of the fitness instructors and users, the way they can coordinate is like a lot of these instructors have Instagram followers, right? So if most of their users are following them on Instagram, they can say, listen, I don't like this platform anymore. Let's just switch to the other one. That's, that's how coordination works in that case. So yeah, that's a problem. In that case, you would have coordination becomes easy and it's, it's certainly a defensibility problem. What is the seventh question? Yeah, so seventh question is whether the matching of buyers to suppliers happens synchronously or asynchronously. So very, very easy example to think about in the case, well, since we beat up on Uber all this, all this time, like we finally get to say something positive about Uber. So in the case of Uber, the matching happens synchronously it means like if I want to ride, it has to be right now, like most of the time. Yes, you can schedule rides, but most of the rides are basically like spontaneous. I need the ride as soon as possible. So in that regard, if you, if most of the matching has to be done synchronously, that actually is defensive. It creates more defensibility because it means you have to have liquidity you have to have a lot of drivers at a given moment in time so you need to get in liquidity and therefore it actually becomes harder for a competitor to come in because they have to have liquidity at any point in time now contrast this with marketplaces in which the um, the magic is asynchronous so maybe you get to do the booking ahead or like you know it's a long time in advance um, all other things equal that actually makes it a little bit easier for uh, competitors to come in so a good contrast to Uber, I was trying to f figure something in the same kind of same kind of space. There's a company in France called BlaBlaCar, which basically is also like, uh, I guess, riders and drivers, both private. But in this case, it's basically for scheduling uh, long distance rides. So let's say I want to go from Paris to Nantes or some, somewhere else in France. And I don't have a car, but there's someone else, someone is driving there next weekend and they have a car. So they can list, okay, we have two seats in my car and I'm looking for people and they have to pay me $50. And, you know, I can go and book it. So this is like a little bit like longer, longer term there. The matching is asynchronous. And I would say my, the, our argument there would be, well, in that case, if someone wants to come in, it's a little bit easier to basically build up both sides because you don't need liquidity at every single moment in time. So it's a little bit easier to, to get started. One of the entrants in Singapore into the ride hailing market, that's exactly how they entered. They only focused on next day rides and oh. cash sharing, so pooling, right, where we have more than more than one passenger riding together. So scheduled rides, that was their focus because that's much easier to enter. Right, they don't need to have drivers at any you know at a moment's notice everywhere across Singapore. They can just direct their drivers to where those book rides are for the following day. Um, so it illustrates the point. Um, another example would be um, in online gaming. So there's a bunch of um, companies that enable um, like expert gamers to come in and help you play your game and win your game and, you know, get you through to the next level or beat your friend that you're playing against. So you can basically just hire them, but you need them on the spot, right? Like I'm, I'm going to die. I, I need someone. So you, these are like really providing instantaneous help within game. Uh, and so there's an example where you really need the marketplaces that enable that they really need to have enough liquidity. So wherever you are, whatever game you're playing, whatever time you can just get that help. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, that that helps provide a little bit of defensibility. Yeah, because they actually need the real time, you know, component, yeah. you know, like it's play not not so easy for another one to come in and compete against one that already has can provide that expert instantaneously, right? they have to build up a sufficient base of expert players on that particular game to compete. So yeah. it does sort of raise the 
sort of the barriers to entry. So basically, your last three questions and on the on that increase uh, that evaluated defensibility, I guess that goes to the point where um, for the startup that are actually that has network effects that answer this that score well on these three questions, it's good if they have a first mover advantage, right? Because everybody start from chicken and egg, critical mass. Once you have critical mass, all these three defensibility then makes sense. You know what I mean? Okay. Um, because everybody anyway have to start from that chicken and eggs in order to have that liquidity, in order to have that hard to coordinate, to leave, yeah. you know, all that stuff, right? Um, actually, you know, just related to that point, if you're evaluating investing in startups mm -hmm. and you looked at these seven criteria mm. and you say on oh, this market, you got all seven things are holding. This looks really good. If you're the first mover, it's like, that's great. You know, you definitely want to invest. If you're the second mover yeah. and you there's an existing incumbent and you have all these seven features, it's actually a bad thing, right? Like yeah. it's, it's, it's actually going to be impossible to break through. Yeah, exactly. Which is what I was thinking to myself, you know, in terms of defense with the third stream as well, it's possible. But then, you know, which means that actually it's about like the first, you know, the last three is like the, if they are the first mover, that'd be great. But the second one, then it's like, well, then, you know, how do you overcome it? It's not possible. That's right. So let's go to the eighth question. So what are some ways that, you know, startup could actually increase defensibility, you know, of their network effects? Eighth question. I mean, you can go back actually on all the previous seven ones and you can say, well, if we like if the answers to one of those questions was not satisfactory so let's say the switching costs were the the multi-homing costs were low you can ask well how can you make the how can you make the multi-homing costs higher so that's one way to increase defensibility again you're the first mover now i want to raise the multi-homing cost because well everyone else makes it difficult for everyone else to come in uh i can also increase just so both switching and multi-homing costs so i can get maybe the more, so how do I increase those? Well, generally speaking, the more I can get users to spend time and to invest resources and in customizing their experience on my platform, the less likely they are that they're going to use a second platform. You know, the more they learn, the more they, you know, they, they, they put stuff that's personalized, they're not going to use a second platform. Um, then another example would be like, so back to the coordination issue, anything I can do to make coordination harder. So if people don't like think about coordination, one way to think about it is like, let's make discovery very important. So the more people come to my platform to discover new transaction interaction partners, the better that is for defensibility. Again, I'm the first mover. I want people to come here to basically discover, you know, if, if buyers to discover new sellers and sellers to discover new buyers. The more that happens, there's very little chance that a second mover comes in and is going to be able to get them because they know, well, I can get all the buyers that I need there and I can get all the sellers I need on the other platform. Why would I move to, to a new entrant? Well, so on the second one, um, thinking about increasing uh, discoverability, I think that's a very real option for a lot of startups. Like they are building, say, our fitness, you know, fitness instructor platform, right? A lot of them just focus on getting fitness instructors on board and using their clientele to build the network, which is fine. Like that's a way to grow quickly. But if they really want to be defensible, they have to sort of turn on that discoverability part. They have to enable... The, the users to discover new, you know, maybe in a different area of fitness, new instructors, right? Make it a destination where people come to, to discover the new instructors and make it a place where instructors want to come to where they can get new users. And then it becomes a much more defensible. So it's really deciding whether they want to do that and opening it up to discoverability. We see this on, uh, interesting, we see this on um, online courses as well. Right, like online courses, they can just be providing tools for instructors to provide these classes. Um, Teachable is a is a platform that does that, right? Um, and we talked about, I think, this in products to platforms, right? They can open that up to discoverability. They can open up a way for their students to discover other courses, right? And then it becomes a place that people come to to, to find out and discover new courses they want to take. And then it becomes a very popular place for instructors to come to to get new students, right? And that is a very real option that these uh, firms face, these startups face when they're building, right? Do I want to enable that discoverability? And that does, you know, the plus side of that is the defensibility that it creates. What are some of the common mistakes that investors uh, make about uh, about network effects when uh, when they look at investing in businesses with network effects? There are many. Uh, I would say a high level, what we see that we found really annoying <laughs> is basically 
overclaiming network effects. Again, at this point, everyone and their grandmother is aware that network effects can lead to like very high value, very high defensibility, and yes, very high valuations from investors. As a result, there's a very, you know, there's this um, uh, temptation to overclaim network effects, even when they're just not there. And we see this all the time. So uh, the common mistakes would be like, well, claiming network effects when in fact it's virality. So it's some of the examples that we talked about, and we see lots of versions of that, uh, or simply just like claiming, okay, we have network effects, therefore this is very defensible. The whole point of this whole like one hour and a half in the conversation that we had is precisely to discuss that just because you have network effects, is absolutely no guarantee of defensibility. Like network effects come in all shapes and sizes. Some of them are great and make for great investments. Some of them are actually no better than investing in, in a restaurant business next door. I mean, just to emphasize Andre's point, we just see it all the time. Like when we're looking at um, deal memos, right? Like we've got network effects and then we're like, where are the network effects? You know. Either they're very minuscule or they're just completely confused. They're not network effects at all, right? And it just comes up again and again and again. Um, the other sort of similar point is they'll say we are, you know, we are Uber for X or, you know, we're Airbnb yeah. for Y. And, it, and, yeah. you, and when you look at what they're doing, it doesn't make any sense at all, right? Yeah. Like not a good understanding of the business models of those, of those businesses. Yeah. I, I guess the only other thing I would add is, you know, on the sort of on the positive side, um, sometimes there's, they're actually overlooking the potential to add network effects into businesses or turn the businesses into platforms. So they're actually underselling the potential of the business because they haven't realized there's this product to platform transformation that can happen that is actually creates a much more valuable product or service than the original one that's, you know, being put forward. Yeah. So I heard that you are having a live cohort uh, class. Um, so the course is, is titled Building and Investing in Network Effects. And essentially, it's a deeper and wider dive in all the topics that we've just discussed. So we'll talk about, obviously, how to evaluate um, the defensibility and prospects of startups that are built on network effects, which is relevant for the startups, but also for investors looking at such companies. And we'll also talk about how to turn product into platforms, which was the topic of our previous um, of our previous podcast. Um, so we'll cover all of that and more. It's a live course. So it's five sessions, two hours, completely live, cohort of 100 people, a uh, combination of startup, uh, startup founders, investors, and um, uh, managers at, uh, at large companies. Yeah, so interesting because you wanted to have a live interactive class instead of a pre-recording video. So obviously make it really much more interesting. So what can they look forward to? Doing everything, doing things live makes for a much better learning experience. So we'll try to make it extremely engaging. Obviously, the other part is like we'll, we use live examples. So we'll walk through examples and we'll actually use we'll, as much as possible. We'll use the participants own companies as examples. So we'll ask them, okay, well, what is one company that, that you're looking to invest in? Or what is your startup? Like, what is it facing? Or what is your product that you're trying to turn into a platform? And try to apply those concepts in, you know, in real time to, uh, to companies that they're very relevant to them. Right. So you're going to use Andre Promise on, on them, right? 30, 30, 30 seconds to turn your product into a platform for that module. That would be really funny. We can do like a, what is it, like a, um, a 20 minute dive where like every participant like comes at me with their, with their company. Yeah. Fire, <laughs> we can do like, all like 30 seconds, like how you turn it into a platform. I, I'm happy to commit to doing that. If people a say. Speed, a speed promise delivery, like, you know, speed instead of speed dating, you have speed yeah, exactly. promise delivery. <laughs> 30 seconds, okay, what is it? I will, I will give you a crazy idea that you've never thought about for how to turn your product into a platform. <laughs> You're going to have some surprise guests as well? Yes, I mean, they're not surprise guests, but yes, we will have, so we'll have a venture capitalist, someone who's very experienced uh, investing in marketplaces. So they've been looking at marketplaces for many years. We'll have a startup founder, so someone who has actually founded a marketplace and is in the process of trying to grow that marketplace. And we'll also have an executive at a large company with successful experience turning a product into platforms. Wow. Is it from one of the customers that you guys have, you know, either Facebook, Visa, MasterCard, ADP, Equifax? No, uh, we cannot say. <laughs> no, we cannot say, but it's definitely, say. it's definitely neither one of those because oh. those were platforms from day one. <laughs> Okay, that would be the surprise, right? The other thing is like, there's a lot of stuff we were going to go much deeper um, into material that we don't put in our substack. Like today we went through seven or eight questions, right? We actually, when we look at like 
investing and network effects businesses, we have 24 questions, um, you know, 24 questions around network effects. So there's actually a lot more depth you can go into, but obviously, you know, we, we don't have time and uh, interview to, to get into all of those nuances. Um, but they, they do make for much more interesting discussions with the cohort of you know, investors and startup founders who are you know, actually interested in these topics from their own perspectives, real world perspectives. Uh, I was going to say, even, I mean, your, your audience can actually, if they take a look at the, uh, the Substack posts uh, that it was relevant for today. So the, uh, the one about the defensibility of network effects, and then they listen to our conversation today, they can already see that the conversation today actually goes already further. In the Substack, so we already added a few nuances. So again, hopefully that pr like provides a good, a good illustration of how much you know how much deeper you can go into like in live conversation into this into these topics. And you like you can probably ask a question live to Andre and Julian as well during these classes, and that's the whole point of having a cohort, right? Absolutely, absolutely, and and, and also sometimes you know other people will give their perspective, right? So. You get that discussion going. It's going to be at Australian time zone, 9 a.m. for us. So it's covers, it covers North America, Asia, Australia, New Zealand perfectly. Not, yeah. good for Europe, not good for Europe, not this time. Next cohort will try to like optimize it more for Europe. Yeah, that's great. So you're going to have a multiple, you know, region cohort. Yeah, no, I think so. Having an Australian company and a US VC could be interesting. So I hope you enjoyed this uh, discussion that we have, which is about the most uh, hyped and most confused topic <laughs> amongst investors and startups, which is about network effects. Please remember to subscribe, like, share to other people, and definitely sign up for Andre and Julian's cohort class. We will provide the link below. Coming up in our next video, we will be talking about chicken and egg. <laughs> No, the last recording we had was about marketplace and reseller, remember? That's what uh, we said. Whatever. Know? I can't hear because I've got rain in my back. <laughs> <laughs> we can't hear your rain. No worries.